May I introduce the master of the World Traders Company, Dr. Edwina Morton. Wardens, Sir David, <clears throat> my lords, Governor, Alderman, Sheriff, Chief Commoner, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome everyone to the World Traders Annual Tastus Lecture. I have the pleasure of being the first Master World Trader to be able to stand here and say not only welcome to the audience in the Guildhall, but also welcome world. This year's lecture is being live streamed, so a particularly warm welcome to any fellow world traders who may be tuning in from around the globe, from New York to New Zealand. For those unfamiliar with the City of London's livery companies, we are the successors to the ancient guilds that were formed to uphold the integrity and standards of their different professions. We all aim to do that still, but these days we are mostly education and charitable organizations. World traders use the funds we raise, along with the time and talents of our members, to support mostly young people in developing the skills they will need to deal with the outside world. We do not take positions on matters of policy, but we do provide a platform to explore the issues involved in international exchange in all its variety. This annual lecture is merely the grandest of those platforms. But not all is serious reflection in the livery. The World Traders Company motto is commerce and honest friendship with all a phrase taken from the inaugural address of President Thomas Jefferson, and friendship is key to how we operate. World traders are the only livery company to hold a Guinness World Record. It was for the most nationalities in a simultaneous popular music sing-along. <laughs> and since you ask, the answer is 84. A happy thought for those who enjoy a little karaoke themselves, including our speaker this evening. But here I trespass on others' turf. It is now my pleasure to invite the Lord Mayor Locum Tenens, Alderman Sir David Wooten, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Sir David was Lord Mayor of the City of London in 2012, the year of the also very friendly London Olympics. Sir David. Master, Wardens, My Lords, Governor, Fellow Alderman, Sheriff, Chief Commoner, Ladies and Gentlemen. Master, thank you for your most kind introduction. On behalf of the Lord Mayor and the City of London Corporation, it is my pleasure and that of Sheriff Liz Green, who's with me, to welcome you all to Guildhall for the 32nd Annual Tacitus Lecture. In a fast-moving world which is only becoming faster, it has never been more important to take the time to pause and think, to look at the bigger picture and to try to see where we're going or where we should go. This lecture gives us a wonderful opportunity to do just that. Since 1988, audiences from across the city's financial professional services sector and the wider city community have been drawn to Guildhall to listen to speakers of prestige and distinction from diverse fields concerned with issues affecting world trade. This evening's lecture continues this excellent line. We're delighted to welcome to the city the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Madame Christine Lagarde. Madame Lagarde studied classics, Latin and Greek at school and then trained and practiced as a lawyer. So that's two good starts. <laughs> in 2005, she was appointed Minister of State for Foreign Trade in the French government, and then Finance Minister in 2007, the first woman to be Finance Minister of a G7 country. Madame Lagarde is enjoying her second term as Managing Director of the IMF and is a most influential figure in international business and government circles. The title of Madame Lagarde's lecture is The Financial Sector, Redefining a Broader Sense of Purpose. There is no better place to address such an issue than here in the City of London, the world's largest financial center and the birthplace of modern 
financial services. Just as the Industrial Revolution transformed the way financial services operated in the 18th century, the digital revolution is having a similar effect today. As correspondence which once took days now takes seconds and contracts which once took months now take minutes, businesses worldwide are becoming more efficient, accurate and prosperous. However, just like the Industrial Revolution, today's digital revolution is also having major social effects. As the rate of technological advancement outstrips that of social and educational reform, more and more people are lacking in the skills needed to succeed in the new digital age. This is putting new demands on business across all sectors. Not only to play a more active role in the education and training of their future workforce, but also that of their clients, ensuring that everyone across diverse social communities has the skills to access the services of the digital era. This new social role in education and training is just one way that the digital revolution is beginning to transform the purpose of business and financial services beyond that of profit making. In today's lecture we will hear more of how financial services should redefine its role to serve the modern society of the 21st century. Thank you to the worshipful company of world traders and in particular its excellent master Dr Edwina Morton for organising this insightful lecture each year, a major contribution to the life of the city. And thank you to Madame Lagarde for talking to us in the city this evening. We are honoured and delighted that you are here and are all very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Master, Wardens, Sir David, my Lords, Governor, Alderman, Sheriff, Chief Commoner, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure and I'm truly honored to have been invited to deliver the Tacitus Lecture in this magnificent Guild Hall. I'm also very fortunate tonight to be among friends, including some former colleagues who know that I have a weakness for stories. So let me start with a Hollywood story. As you may know, Disney Studios were recently faced with the challenge of creating a sequel to the original Mary Poppins movie. That movie has delighted all of you and possibly your children for more than half a century. The producers of the new film recreated the magical nanny from P.L. Travers' books, but they also featured a new cast of characters, including a villain who could give everybody a good scare. What's a good story without a good scare anyway? That villain, yes, you guessed it, that villain is a sleek banker who is cheating his way to fortune. And in the end, of course, as all good stories would have it, the villain is defeated by a touch of magic. So here is my question. Why is the banker the villain? After all, a healthy economy requires a healthy financial sector that is at the service of people as they pursue better lives for themselves and their children. You might call it every day's magic of finance, helping families buy a home, save for retirement, helping business access to capital, to support growth and employment, helping ordinary people manage risks and prepare for a rainy day. 
And that is what most financial professionals actually do on a day-to-day -day basis with dedication and a sense of pride. And yet, despite these good aspects, the caricature of the bad banker has resonated with audiences since the dawn of civilization. And its latest version, seen by millions of children around the world, is telling us something about the deeply felt sense of unease about the role of finance in today's world. It does not take history, sociology, or religion, let alone magic, to trace most of this most recent frustration back to the global financial crisis, which has left painful economic and psychological scare, scars on millions of people. We know also that many people are angry about the steady drip, drip, drip of financial scandals and misconduct that have occurred all over the world. And indeed, financial globalization has been one of the key drivers of what Theodore Roosevelt called the swollen fortunes of the few. What would be today this new gilded age with high economic inequality and low social mobility. On Wall Street, for example, overall compensation levels have been reaching record highs yet again. And there is a similar trend of moving back to pre-crisis pay levels in other financial centers as well. No wonder that growing concerns about finance can be heard across the political spectrum and not just about the issues of the day, but about the fundamental purpose of the industry. In too many cases, the financial sector has strayed from its original noble purpose, and too often it has worked first for itself, and second, to serve people and the economy at large. And surely, there must be a better way forward, which brings me to the theme that I would like to discuss tonight. I believe that we can build a better financial sector, one that is safer, more sustainable, and ethically sound. A financial industry with a broader sense of purpose. And that goal is not just morally just, but it is economically right. Why? Because a better financial sector is more important than ever to help deliver what in our 21st century, we badly need in many corners of the world. Higher employment, greener growth, and good living standards for all. The key to achieving this goal is to reshape finance into something that is more aligned with societal values and more connected to the interests of all stakeholders, from customers to workers to shareholders to local communities and to future generations. Now, to do this, we need more than just a touch of Mary's famous brawly. So let me propose two questions. First, how can we make the financial system safer to encourage the good and not the bad side of finance? And second, how can the financial sector support long-term growth that is more sustainable and more inclusive? I will try to address these two questions. First, how can we make the system safer? Let me begin with a simple observation. If finance is to become safer and more trustworthy, it will need to harness good innovation, better regulation, and a broader sense of responsibility. So let me start with the good innovation first. Students of history will tell us that these issues have resonated through the ages. For one, it is remarkable just how much influence financial innovation has had on human progress. Think of its instrumental role in the development of writing, of mathematics, of accounting, and probability theory. Consider Chinese paper money introduced in the 9th century, or the 13th century Venetian who eagerly bought prestiti, the first true government bonds. And think of how we can draw the line between the first stock exchanges in Antwerp and Amsterdam 
to, of course, the London Stock Exchange, and to our modern investment apps that put the global financial markets at our fingertips. At the same time, history tells us about unsustainable credit booms and speculative bubbles that were driven by bright financial ideas that didn't turn out to be so good. In ancient Rome, in the year 33 before Christ, land prices crashed after noble families took out loans to bet on ever-rising land prices. Ultimately, the government of Emperor Tiberius bailed out the investors by extending three-year interest-free budgetary loans. Sounds familiar. Sure it was in Rome? And how do we know this? Well, Tacitus himself briefly described this financial crisis in his final works. But this is only one of many examples. In the 17th century tulip mania, it was a new market for future contracts. In the 18th century South Sea bubble, it was the promise of a mythical new land. In the 19th and 20th century, it was often new technology from the railway mania to the dot-com bubble. And of course, in the run-up to the global financial crisis, it was financial engineering that helped drive a frenzy of reckless risk-taking. So when Lehman Brothers collapsed, policymakers were facing what I once referred to as a holy cow moment. The most striking thing for all of us back then, and some of you in the room were highly involved in all that, was actually the incredible fragility of so many advanced economy banks. At their very core, these firms had been weakened by inadequate equity capital, flawed business models, and, and the blindness of powerful men. A toxic combination that left taxpayers on the hook for massive bank bailouts. Fast forward to the present, and the real question is whether the financial system is safer today. And our short answer, my short answer is, it is safer, but it is not yet safe enough. And there are many of us here who are working hard to make it safe enough. So let me move to better regulation. Over the past decade, countries have worked together to reform the global financial regulations to help rebuild trust and restore financial health. This ambitious effort in which the IMF, the Financial Stability Board, thank you, Mark, the G20 and many others have been involved, has made a substantial difference. Banks have much higher capital and liquidity positions. Big banks are facing tighter regulation and their leverage is lower. Winding down failing banks has become much easier in all major jurisdictions and in many emerging economies. And a big chunk of the derivative market has become significantly more transparent. This is all very good but it is not good enough. We need further efforts to address the potential dangers of too big to fail as banks become even bigger and more complex. In the United States, for instance, the five top banks now hold about 45% of total banking assets compared with just about 40% in 2007. Meanwhile, Leading economists and industry experts have been calling for further increases in equity funding beyond the current capital requirements to ensure that banks can withstand a potential storm. This is a call that New Zealand has just recently heard, by the way. Others are not so sure, my own compatriots included, I have to say, because further increases in equity funding might come with negative side effects, such as reduced lending, so they say. So far, the evidence points to relatively small costs of higher capital. But above all, we must be concerned about increasing discrete efforts to roll back some post-crisis regulations. Countries need to resist these pressures. And indeed, they need to push on because more work and political will are required 
to fully implement the existing reforms. And as policymakers are still internalizing the lessons from the last crisis, they need to be vigilant about the new risks. For example, we at the IMF have estimated that cyber attacks could potentially lead to net income losses in the global banking system alone of up to $300 billion. Or think of a sharp adjustment in asset prices that could affect the fast-growing shadow banking sector. That part of the financial world comes with many regulatory blind spots that should be addressed. For instance, we believe that countries need to regulate underwriting standards in high-risk debt markets, including leverage loans. Now, of course, making finance safer is not just going to be about innovation and better regulation. It is also going to be about a broader sense of individual and collective responsibility. Responsible behavior has a lot to do with incentives, especially monetary incentives. And there is no question that remuneration policies in the banking sector were driving reckless risk-taking before the financial crisis. As one analyst from this country who writes in an orange pinky paper put it, he was going to be here tonight, but he had to give a lecture himself. Employ as little liquidity as one can, promise a high return on equity, link bonuses to the achievement of this return target in the short term, and ensure that as few as possible of these rewards are clawed back in the event of catastrophe. We know how that story ended. And we know that there is a widely shared perception that those who caused the crisis did not face the consequences while ordinary people paid a heavy price. And many people actually saw this as the ultimate breach of public trust. So what has changed since then? Well, for one, post-crisis reforms have significantly moved the needle by better aligning individual pay with the health of the firm. If you are a senior banker here in the City of London, 40 to 60% of your variable remuneration is going to be deferred over anywhere between three and seven years and it can be reduced, cancelled, or clawed back in case of poor performance and misconduct. In other words, bankers have more skin in the game. In the UK, senior bankers and traders also have to comply with the so-called senior manager and certification regime, which has increased accountability and is helping firms to set a better tone at the top. And here, as I would like to command one of my former IMF colleagues and friends, Minou Shafiq, who in her role as Deputy Governor of the Bank of England under the leadership of Governor Kearney, did so much to promote codes of conduct for financial markets. Certainly more can be done, from making clawbacks more consistent across countries, to enhancing the disclosure of disciplinary actions within firms, to creating, to creating a global code of conduct. And let us not forget the power of criminal and civil liability. The sleeping lawyer inside myself is waking up now. In major financial centers, we see a more forceful pursuit of individual wrongdoing. But the brunt of legal action, amounting to billions of dollars of fine, which makes the headline, is borne by financial firms, where it is often perceived simply as the cost of doing business. The reality is that even the toughest legal actions, I would put aside probably the criminal ones because you cannot put a firm in custody. But even the toughest legal sanctions and the smartest compensation and governance rules cannot be substitutes for a strong individual responsibility that is grounded in values and ethics. For it is not just the, top, the tone at the top, but the response from the bottom that creates a better and more trusted corporate culture. That is why the financial industry needs what I call an ethics upgrade. Now, what do I mean? For financial professionals, it simply means doing the right things, even 
when nobody is watching. As one banker, a very senior one, said once to me, he said, when in doubt, I just wonder what my mother would say. It sounds so sim simple, and yet it is perhaps the hardest thing to do. We all know that the word credit comes from the Latin root credere, which is trust, which is belief, which is the lifeblood of the financial system. But trust cannot be manufactured, cannot be bought, cannot be mandated. It must be earned through virtuous behavior that is intrinsically motivated again, done or not done, even when nobody is watching. And here one could draw inspiration from Aristotle, who argued that we are all driven by a sense of purpose. We can achieve our purpose by developing virtues such as justice, courage, self-control, prudence, generosity, and honesty. And Aristotle believed that this was the key to genuine happiness. That spirit can also help achieve a purposeful banking career and a safer and more trusted financial system. But this is not the whole story. Aristotle also believed that individual purpose must always be linked to social purpose, to the common good, which is not tantamount to uh, what a, a former president of the Fed assumed was right and was not, which was that the addition of the individual purposes would actually equal common good. So this applies to all aspects of our life, including corporations and financial firms. The goal of a corporation cannot be just about its narrow financial interest. It must also encompass a broader sense of responsibility, common responsibility. And it is not surprising, therefore, to see growing debates about the nature of modern corporations and the concept of maximizing shareholders' value. As the British economist Colin Meyer put it, for nearly all of its 2,000-year history, the corporation has combined a public purpose with its commercial activities. It is only over, <clears throat> over the last 60 years that the idea that profit is the only purpose of business has emerged. I believe that encouraging a broader common responsibility is now more important than ever not just for today's stakeholders, but for future generations. Which brings me to my second question. How can the financial sector support long-term growth that is more sustainable and that is more inclusive? So let me start with a data point. Over the next 15 years, more than $24 trillion of wealth will be inherited by the millennials. And they are more than twice as likely as other generations to invest in companies or funds that target social or environmental outcomes. The financial industry has seized this opportunity by offering various forms of impact investing, green bonds, and a panoply of fund products that take account of ESG. I haven't told you anything about SDGs yet, it's coming but ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance issues. Clearly, sustainable investing is booming, but it also points to a deeper issue. Whether you are a banker, a fund manager, a fintech entrepreneur, you are probably wondering how to take a more sustainable approach that is both economically rewarding and ethically right. And I understand that there is a national dialogue which is beginning in this country to actually understand and appreciate how those two goals can be mingled, economically rewarding and ethically right. And I believe that this offers a huge opportunity to redefine the magic of finance to pursue a broader sense of purpose. I know for a fact, because I've discussed that with many of them, that there are equity fund managers who do not believe a word of that and who will pay polite lip service to the principle of this ethically right aspect. But 
I support the idea that they might be proven wrong. Let's talk about innovation. I've talked about innovation, so why do I talk about innovation again? Because I want to tell you a little bit about fintech. The immediate priority should be to foster cutting-edge financial technology. You've heard that before. That means creating fintech products that are substantially cheaper, more accessible, and more user-friendly. It means serving customers and communities in new and better ways. It also means rethinking the economics of the financial industry itself. Bear with me. In the United States, for example, the unit cost of financial intermediation has remained largely unchanged over the past century, while income from finance has risen and fallen with the value of financial assets. Now, that suggests a significant amount of rent extraction. The fintech response to that is to increase competition, reduce inefficiencies, and provide better value for money to individuals and small businesses. And in doing so, fintech can help drive an inclusion revolution. In Kenya, in China, mobile payment systems have brought millions of previously unbanked people into the financial system. In Latvia, in Brazil, and elsewhere, peer-to-peer -peer lending has opened up new sources of credit for small businesses. And around the world, blockchain enables faster and cheaper transactions, from trading securities to sending money to relative, to relative abroad. And this is only the beginning of that inclusion revolution. I also, you've, you've picked examples in developing countries, emerging markets maybe. No, it applies to advanced economies as well because we shouldn't forget the 1.5 million people who in this country still have no bank account. We should not forget the 33 million US households who are either unbanked, that's a terrible word actually, it's like deep lane, let's say underbanked or do not have a bank account. Uh, and obviously those numbers are much larger in emerging and developing countries. So there is a huge opportunity to boost financial inclusion, which as we know, leads to stronger growth and higher employment. And this in turn requires vibrant digital ecosystems such as London, which is home to the biggest cluster of fintech startups in Europe. Now, that won't go away, whatever the outcome of what is not talked about tonight. <laughs> but fintech will not do it alone. We also need better regulation and smarter supervision to ensure that fresh sources of credit do not encourage people to overborrow and that personal data is protected against prying eyes and criminals. In other words, banking-type fintech services should be subject to banking regulations, especially when it comes to consumer protection. For new firms, this means working with regulators to unlock the immense potential of fintech while managing the risks. This is the goal of what we have called the Bali Fintech Agenda that was launched by the IMF and the World Bank last October. It provides the key principles including on promoting competition and consumer choices and fighting money laundering or the financing of terrorism. And that Bali agenda can actually help guide their endeavor and our joint endeavor in the period ahead. And together with a few enlightened, we are going to pursue that agenda. Now, you would probably be fairly disappointed with me if tonight, as I'm talking about this inclusion revolution, I was not going to go a little bit beyond fintech because it also encompasses the need for more diverse leadership in finance. And I say this for two reasons. First, greater diversity always sharpens thinking while reducing the potential for groupthink. And second, diversity also leads to more prudence and better decision making. Our own research bears this out. A higher share of women 
on the board of banks and financial supervision agencies is associated, there are strong correlations actually, with greater financial stability. Not causality, correlation. Which underpins stronger and more durable growth. And believe me, we have a long way to go. We've done the research and across the globe, only 2% of banks, CEOs, are women. And less than a fifth of bank board members are women. Here in the UK, the Hampton Alexander Review has been urging the largest listed companies to increase the proportion of women on boards to at least one third by 2020. You are almost there, not quite. Would quotas make a difference? My answer is yes, as long as they're properly designed and implemented. And a good example is that, for those in doubt, is Norway, where over five years, mandatory quotas supported a four-fold increase in the proportion of women on corporate boards. And clearly, more female leadership is critical, and not just at the top, but as consumer of financial services. Women all over the world are making their voices increasingly heard when it comes to investing their own money. For example, recent surveys show that women are far more likely to engage in sustainable investing than men. And they're driving demand for new products, such as funds targeting gender equality in corporations. That spirit is beautifully captured by the fearless girl statue on Wall Street. Which brings me to my final point. I believe that fearless action and fresh ideas are needed more than ever to invest for the global common good. Think about it. Trillions of dollars in private sector investments will need to be mobilized to tackle climate change and to achieve the SDGs the Sustainable Development Goals, which are aimed at eliminating poverty by 2030, and more than this, making the planet just a better place for our children and their children. These goals endorsed by the global community, almost, constitute a daunting challenge. But they are also a huge opportunity, especially in the financial sector. Only a few years ago, the financial industry perceived climate risk as a distant threat Governor Mark Carney famously called it the tragedy of the horizon. But that time horizon has since shifted much closer to the present. We are in February and daffodils are blooming all over the place. Call it normal. Major hurricanes in the Caribbean, wildfires in California, severe floodings in part of the UK. These are just a few but powerful reminders of an economic threat that is already affecting the livelihoods of too many individuals and communities. And there are now growing economic debates over the likely effects of climate change on productivity, on incomes, on financial stability, even on monetary policy, not to mention migration pressures. So what does it mean for the financial sector? It means shifting to a more sustainable form of finance that is grounded in better risk management and longer term thinking. It also means mobilizing more finance for investment opportunities in people and infrastructure. For example, the IMF recently estimated that the additional spending needed for low income countries, it's only about 49 of them, to achieve the sustainable development goals in only a few sectors like health, education, and low carbon infrastructure. So that's only three of the 17 principles included in the SDGs. That, those three, would cost about 250 billion per year in 2030. 520 billion. And that gap can only be filled through a combination of public and private resources, from bank lending to project finance, to so-called blended finance, which brings together grants, concessional financing, and commercial funding. And nobody is excluding anybody else. It's really for public and private investment to complement each other, not substitute. 
They must go hand in hand to create the right conditions for investment. And that includes sound economic policies, strong legal frameworks, good governance, and zero tolerance for corruption, whether in the public or in the private sector, paying or receiving. And the sustainable development goals are not just about the developing economies. They're designed to promote global growth that is stronger, fairer, and environmentally friendly. If the sustainable development goals are to deliver on that promise, we will also need to harness the momentum of the sustainable investing sector, which already accounts for $23 trillion, or 26% of global assets under management. How might that be done? Fund managers could, for example, launch new investment products that encourage corporations to align their business models with that of the Sustainable Development Goals. They could also work with policymakers to create global standards for sustainability accounting and reporting. This would boost transparency and strengthen the credibility of sustainable investment. We need to measure and account for. As I said, this is the moment when fearless action is absolutely critical, when fresh ideas can help break the mold, when we join hands to foster the global common goods. So let me, by way of conclusion, return to Mary Poppins. Remember the scene where the good banker teaches his children a lesson about purpose. And he argues that they should follow in his footsteps and he sings the following lines. Now, karaoke, yes, but I don't have the music, so I will not sing tonight. <laughs> a British bank is run with precision. A British home requires nothing less. Tradition, discipline, and rules must be the tools. Without them, disorder, chaos, moral disintegration. In short, you have a ghastly mess. Well, that is one way of putting it. But the question is whether young people today should consider joining the financial industry. For many of them, the answer comes down to finding a broader sense of purpose, a bit like Mary Poppins herself. The genius of her character is that she's not serving herself first. She's serving others with dignity, with a kind heart, with honesty, and with a wicked sense of humor. Well, some people like to describe the old traditional common sense banker as a sad man in a gray suit. May I suggest that those new bankers of the future be just like her? Dignity, kind heart, honesty, and a wicked sense of humor. That's really what the financial industry could be about and no better place than London for that wicked sense of humor. Serving other, others, not yourself, that is the real magic of finance. Thank you. I think I can speak for everybody in the room uh, saying after that there's only one word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> <laughs> have six microphones, so hopefully it won't take very long for the mics to get to people. Um, when you are called on, please introduce yourself by giving your name and affiliation before you ask your question. And please speak clearly into the mics. Um, the acoustics in a room this size and of this age are never going to be perfect. Um, the questions will include some from students in the room from schools and colleges we support. Um, but first, um, if I may, I will go to 
Anne Robbins, uh, who is here with CET, to ask the first question. Thank you. Uh, Anne Robbins, Commercial Education Trust. Madame Lagarde, first of all, thank you very much for making us think so hard about how we should and could improve. Um, my question is, um, how can UK educators, employers and policymakers um, help prepare those very young people that you talked about at the end um, to, for, to take up roles in an improved financial sector um, so that the UK financial sector does actually take its rightful and highly functional place in the global economy. Okay. Managing Director, if I might leap in here because I have a question on the ethical upgrade which I think sits very well with this one if Anne doesn't mind. When one looks at the finance industry it seems that the rewards are potentially so great from pushing boundaries that unwise or unethical conduct seems to be baked into the business model. Where regulation is used to try and nudge things in one direction or another to improve the way the industry works, it often has unintended consequences. How does one break that pattern um, in order to get the ethical upgrade that you're concerned mm -hmm. with? Well, first of all, I'm delighted that you bring together those whose task it is to train, educate, and open to the world those young people. Educators, you said, policymakers, employers. And it is good that you bring them together because I think it starts with that. Uh, you know, in, in my position at the IMF, I see too many countries where the, where the educational system is operating in its bubble as a silo, totally disconnected for what happens in the real world and with little to do with the policymakers other than uh, their budget. So I think that a combined approach of the three together is critically important. Because we know, and you know, we're not the ultimate experts on education, but we know that probably about two-thirds of the children who are born in this decade will have jobs that do not exist today. So it requires the three to come together and to constantly uh, iterate amongst themselves without any uh, you know, preconceived agenda or turf about whose prerogative it is to set what in order to prepare uh, the, uh, the, the children of, of today to the jobs of tomorrow. It's a very difficult task and uh, it's one which is vitally important. I would submit that, and again, this is, this is more what we are seeing in some countries or what some experts are telling us, but I would submit that it's not so much about um, training some of those uh, young people for a task, but it's about training their, their brain and their capacity to adjust and to learn more skills. It's about really using the right and the left side of their brain uh, in equal proportion. It's not just about learning sciences. It's not just about learning how to, to code, which I've heard in so many places, which is partly misplaced, because if it's only that, then it's probably not going to be that useful in 20 years' time. Uh, I would add, and that's also to address uh, you part of the question, that although for a period of time, about 15 years ago, business schools had included in their curriculum uh, some, uh, you know, it was the post Enron time. So there was some ethics uh, classes and courses uh, included in the curriculum of those going to business schools in particular. That has a little bit faded by the side, uh, and I'm so pleased that so many sensible people are now looking at these issues of ethics, of values, of fight against corruption, and some of them are actually leaving their jobs at the IMF to go and teach. I'm s speaking here about one of... Um, my former dearest colleague, who was the general counsel of the IMF, who decided to stop what he was doing at the IMF to actually go and teach these issues and specialize on, on ethics and how we can communicate ethics and how we can train in ethics so that when nobody is watching, it's the right decision that is made. So I, I really believe that ethics must have its full space in those training, uh, sessions in those curriculum, in those classes, and it must be taught at the highest level by the most engaged people. 
We're now going to go, <coughs> excuse me, to a question from uh, Maddie Griffiths from Totteridge Academy. It's one of the schools we have links with. Maddie, would you identify yourself to whoever's holding the microphone? Uh, Maddie Griffiths from the Totteridge Academy. I'd like to say thank you, Madame Lagarde, for the lecture. Where are uh, you? <laughs> I was six years old when the last recession began. All I've known is austerity my entire life. My question for you is, as a 16-year-old, will this continue to be forever recurring as I prepare to enter the workforce? And do you have any advice for my generation from how we can confront this? Well, that's probably the toughest question of the day. <laughs> you know, I sincerely hope not. In other words, I sincerely hope that uh, your life is not going to be um, rhymed by principles of austerity and restrictions, uh, although I do believe that the principles of discipline and, and measures will continue to apply because I think that that is also a precondition for um, you know, our economies and our societies to prosper, to be sustainable and to be just. Uh, but I would hope that having gone through those 10 years of um, curing some of the um, dysfunctionment of the system, I would hope that uh, your economy, our economies, and our global economy uh, will be able to grow in a more sustainable way, uh, in, in a fairer way as well, and that we will take the right policies to actually address what I regard as one of the biggest threats on an horizon that, as I said earlier, is getting closer to us, which is that of the risk associated with climate change. It's not the only one and there are clearly risks associated with excessive inequality as well that need to be addressed. And if I'm, if I'm to believe the surveys that we conduct or that we have conducted around the world to understand what young people worry about, uh, what we hear from them, uh, it's you know, more than uh, jobs, uh, more than uh, uh, equality. What they are really concerned about is the issue of corruption. So I would suggest that you, yourself, uh, decide for yourself. It's not for me to tell you because it's going to be your future, much more so than mine. But you decide for yourself on the basis of actual facts, of actual figures, of analytical work that you will be able to assess in terms of validity and credibility, that you decide for yourself what is worth uh, fighting for and, and engaging uh, in society so that you have that society which does not rhyme only with austerity. Uh, Patrick Young. But although it's for you to decide, I'll be here to help. <laughs> Patrick Young, I'm a fintech entrepreneur, blockchain multi and exchange invest. Madam Lagarde, while the World Traders Company has done much to promote female inclusion, as our master's presence readily attests, I'm curious, how can individual world traders improve the inclusion of women throughout the global economy? Multiple ways. Um, I, I would, again, go back to what I was just saying. Facts, figures, analytical work uh, should you know, drive us in that direction. Uh, I would say that it starts with eradicating uh, the legal impediments to equality of treatment, to equality of wages, to proper participation of all in the labor market and in the economy. And it's very surprising to see, you know, that 80% of, our, we have a membership of 189 countries. 80% of those countries have in their constitution or in their legal system, provisions that discriminate against women, that make it harder for them to inherit, to have collaterals, to have access to finance, uh, to be able to get a job without permission, and so on and so forth. So I would say that it starts with that, but it's not going to be enough. It's going to require the endorsement of both men and women uh, to make sure that those choices are available, and it will require cultural changes that need to be constantly reinforced. It happens, you know? Uh, often I'm asked, you know, do you see changes? 
And yes, there are changes. Um, you know, we worked with Japan recently quite extensively because Japan clearly has a labor force issue and failing to give access to migrants to its labor market, it simply does not have enough labor power. So it came across that actually there was fantastic labor force available in the Japanese society that looked Japanese, that talked Japanese, but that were women. <laughs> so Prime Minister Abe, bless his cotton socks if I may say, decided that it was worth investing, that better childcare centers were in order, and that he had to ask his very traditional uh, world traders organizations and other guilds uh, in Japan to actually do exactly that, include women and make sure that uh, those endless meetings do not take place or do not begin at 6 p.m. in the evening. I'm saying that because it goes down to very practical details. To give you an example, I know this is becoming trivial, but I, I apologize in advance. But we see that in our programs. If you want to help certain women access the labor market, you need to have good transportation where they are not at risk. So having a budget item that says transportation that is safe is going to be critical. Uh, we have <coughs> excuse me, time for probably one more question, so I'm going to go back to one of our schools. And Daniel, and I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly, Benedica, uh, from the London Academy of Excellence, would you identify yourself and ask your question? Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm from the London Academy of Excellence. Firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for delivering such an informative and uh, inspirational uh, lecture, especially for young people such as myself. Uh, I'd like to ask this a question. Uh, recently, you described your role and the IMFs as both a firefighter and an, um, an architect. Over the last 70 odd years, would you describe the IMF's role as a better, as a better firefighter or a better architect? <laughs> and if so, how, how has this changed over the last 10 years? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for following me on following me on Instagram. I guess. <laughs> you know, it has it has really changed over the course of time, and there have been periods where uh, the the IMF was a pure firefighter. Um, you know, in in times of really uh, broad crisis, and I'm thinking, you know, clearly of the the. the the great financial crisis. I don't know why we call it great, actually. Um, the financial crisis that kept many of us busy in 2000, from 2007 on to, on, on to post the uh, European sovereign debt crisis. I think we were operating as firefighters at the time. Uh, I remember some of our colleagues saying that we, you know, some of us needed a big bazooka. I was thinking of a big hose rather than bazooka sometimes. But clearly we were operating as firefighters at the time. Equally, when, uh, when we were called upon to help after the uh, Iron Curtain fell, and where many of the former Soviet Union's um, peripheric countries decided to, uh, to change their, their model to operate differently, to go for different values, then we, we really intervened as architects. And from, you know, the, from, from monetary policy to debt management to public finance management, we, we had to help them invent new systems. And in so doing, we also modified often the way in which we were designing and operating uh, to serve them. So I would say that it depends, it depends on, on, the, on the periods, it depends on the economic circumstances, and hopefully as we uh, act as firefighters, we have in the back of our mind our architect um, tools and skills in order to better prepare for the after, uh, after fire. So that's the end of the Q&A. <clears throat> I apologize to the couple of hands that have, uh, have gone up, but we are running out of time. If you just allow me to get to the podium to offer a vote of thanks. Thank you, Managing Director, for that entertaining, yet very deliberately thought-provoking lecture and for taking on the questions so fully. For good or ill, we have, and we've had recent experience of both in this city, 
Finance is one of the fundamental forces that will shape our future. It can enable the flow of goods and services and spread prosperity. It can even underpin and reinforce the intellectual power that is needed to solve some of today's most challenging problems. And yet it can also bring the world economy to breaking point. Tonight we have heard how finance needs to be able to channel more of the good that it can undoubtedly do for our common future. And as Sir David said, what better place to address these issues than the City of London, which has a unique role in financing global exchange of all kinds that goes back centuries and that rests on open trade and openness to ideas and to people from all over the globe. <clears throat> Our event this evening has been made possible by a number of key people and organizations. World traders would particularly like to thank HSBC, not only for their support of this evening's event, including the live streaming, but most especially for their otherwise unsung background help and advice over many months as we brought the whole event together. We are also grateful to our other sponsors, to Wendy Drew, whose late husband Peter was a founder of the World Traders as a guild and later as a livery company, to Bloomberg and to Aon. For some years now, we've also had the firm backing of the Commercial Education Trust for this lecture, and we thank them most warmly for their support. A short report they have just issued entitled Future Proofing the Next Generation <clears throat> will be freely available in the reception. We will be shortly moving to the old library for that reception, but in order to allow this number of people to get as quickly as possible to a refreshing drink, the mic holders will now magically transform themselves, Mary Poppins style, into ushers. After the speaker and the principal guests have left, we will be emptying the hall from the front and from the rear. Please wait until you're asked to move and then move as quickly as possible to whichever exit is indicated. World traders will be on hand to guide you. If you would like to find out more about us, um, there is information in your lecture brochure. Please feel free also to buttonhole any of my colleagues, especially those supporting the green badges of our membership committee. But before we all leave this splendid hall, please join me once again in thanking our speaker, Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the IMF, for delivering the 32nd Tastas Lecture this evening.